I'm going to briefly skim over this. Um, I've obviously explained this in the context of a one-dimensional data set, these three examples. But you have to remember the technique is ultimately is an n-dimensional technique. So when we think about a 1D vector, then actually what we have is a vector over time. And a vector could be a ground reaction force with its three components. We tend to break them up into a horizontal or two horizontal and a vertical component. Well, actually, it's a vector where the components are not independent of each other. It's possible to vary just one thing, which is the magnitude of the vector, and have ultimately variation in all other three components. A force vector is easy. If I have a force vector at an angle and I increase its magnitude at that angle, then I have actually an increase in both or possibly all three components of the vector. Which doesn't mean that I have three times an independent difference or effect. No, actually, there's only one effect because they co-varied. Yeah? And so that's where we need to really, very often in our observations, take that covariance into account by applying what we would call vector field analysis. And so we can apply the same temporal analysis it's not overly clear, but let me just show you the, the real thing. So what we have here is time goes from that point to there. And we have a vector that you can see a number of examples of that vector on the, on the actual. And you can see the very first one actually is very horizontal there in that direction. Yeah. And what we have is we have a horizontal plane, anterior posterior in this case. And we have a vertical plane, which you can see presented or projected onto the onto the wall of that graph. So that's actually this here. That's the vertical component. And so what we have is we have variation in the horizontal component, which you can see by those little blue dots. And we have variation in the vertical components. These variations are not independent. These variations are dependent on each other. And that's visualized on plotting the variation of the two components against each other. And you can see that the variation actually are ellipses. And the fact that they are ellipses with a certain direction, a certain principal axis, means that they have covariance. And so we should take that into account when we analyze our data. So we can actually analyze our data accordingly. So let me just show you one example. This is here an example of comparing two <coughs> conditions of data where we have now done what we would call a hotel and steel test, so a vector test in this case. And we actually calculate our T curve in the same way again for comparing those, but this is now for a vector. So we don't have to break them up into individual components. We can see whether the vector actually has any or justifies the rejection of our null hypothesis in any way. Yeah? Once we have done that and we see that the hypothesis has been rejected in this case, and very strongly rejected in this case, then we can go and look at individual components in the same way as we did by a post hoc analysis. And so in that case, we can again go towards post hoc analysis, but I won't go into detail about that uh, just here now in terms of what this data is. But you can see the principle, I hope, about how you can go about by doing particular tests or also even including multivariate testing in terms of um, vector analysis. So we've seen some principles. We've seen some examples, which hopefully give you a better idea of why Statistical parametric mapping is, is potentially useful in the field and also how it can be used very similarly to what people are already doing all the time in very basic testing. So let's just let me close down the session by saying how you could potentially get yourself ready uh, and, and get going with it. Um, well, then I need to immediately refer you to the website where we gather all the information as much as we can as soon as it, as it is I would say set in stone. Um, we obviously are doing a lot of developments in the background which we don't necessarily publish before they are set in stone in terms of before they are published, properly tested, validated, etc. Um, but anything that is already uh, to an extent set in stone uh, is available on the website. Um, and what we have there is we have the downloads obviously of, of the particular software application that you can apply. Uh, documentation, we have references that we, we provide a list of references that are uh, essential to, to get your way around. Uh, also, I would like to mention that we try to organize workshops. We've in the past organized one here in Leuven already, uh, I think two years ago. 
Um, um, and we are, we're continuing to find opportunities to organize these workshops and they, they seem to go very well in setting people up for really getting the confidence of starting to use it. Because one thing is getting the confidence of running it uh, yourself and I'll show you how, how it can be done. Um, but the other thing is also, well, getting the confidence of reporting it in your papers. If you get a review, or what am I going to say to that review? Do I use something that I'm not overly sure about? Well, in the workshop, we make sure that we actually provide you in two days' time all the necessary tools to get to grips with the basics, how to use SBM, and then you can do the further explorations in terms of more complicated things yourself, but getting that, but also getting to getting you to understand really in depth what why it is beneficial and what are the pros and the cons against this parametric mapping and also how you can then report it in your methods and report it in your results um, which uh, we think is very important for getting people up and running um, as i said most of it is uh, organized uh, on this uh, particular website so definitely go there if you want further information also the website will inform you about uh, particular data sets that might become available um, particular new uh, analysis techniques that are becoming available and then you might probably think, okay, right, um, we're talking about MATLAB and Python here. Um, the bottom line is that when you want to learn to use SPM, actually you don't have to be a MATLAB expert. Um, it's very basic code that is ultimately founded on two principles in most cases. Uh, and I'll explain you this with this example code here. So we have MATLAB code and Python code. For those people who, have, who are not familiar with these two packages, MATLAB is obviously something that is well known by people. Python is less well known. It's ultimately the same, um, but it's an open source uh, application. So Python is free, MATLAB is expensive, and so that's why um, both are uh, available. Um, in terms of the syntax, it's very similar, but you need to be able to understand either or um, so you need to have a little bit of background in Python if you want to start using it. Again, it's the hurdle should not be the programming or the, uh, the usage of those packages because the hurdle here, if you look at it, what we do is we first load one data set, then we load another data set. In this case, it's random data that we generate, but you could load your own data. And then those two data sets I want to compare with a t-test, for example. Well, then what you have is you first do your descriptives, so that's one line of code which will output all your descriptives in terms of your averages, your standard deviations, etc., etc., um, that are useful. Um, it will output that, and then you will use the output of that to calculate your inference. Now, your inference process, as I said before, is a separate process. It's actually calculating the probability of having discovered something that is different from zero or different from each other based on the behavior of random fields so random curves in this case with a certain smoothness and that's the critical difference with your standard statistics we don't tend to be taught that in standards in our classical hypothesis that these are two different processes but actually with your discrete values you do the same thing we all think that the decision making process is actually based on our data well, actually it's not. It's only based on your degrees of freedom uh, and your, your population that you are uh, looking at. And it's based on the random behavior of data in such contexts. That normal distribution is not specific to your data, actually. That's why people who learned statistics in the past, who had to go through the back of books, all these tables to calculate the, the ultimately the alpha level or calculate your, your t-value that is critical, your p-value, well, actually, that was based on nothing to do with your data. That was purely based on your um, experiment that you did. And this is the same thing. This applies the same thing. So again, your inf inference then will provide you a critical value and ultimately also those cluster of definitions, etc. Yeah. Good. I think that's where I will uh, leave it for today. So I would like to once more recognize the other two uh, guys uh, who uh, we work very hard on developing this technique and disseminating this te technique publishing the technique first from a theoretical perspective, but in most cases also from an applied perspective, so that hopefully people who want to use it can get the confidence from having some background literature uh, and in the previous examples to actually start using it also in their research. Okay? Good. Thank you.